This is part two of COVID-19 conspiracy question mark, part six, which is empowering yourself. Now that might be confusing part two of part six, but that's exactly what it is. It's part two of part six. So part six has been broken up into four parts. We released part one yesterday. Today's part two of six. And the entire part six in its entirety is available on the advanced medicine dashboard. If you don't know about the advanced medicine dashboard or you haven't created your free advanced medicine dashboard, just click the links in the description on this video and it will take you there. Follow the links and it will get you there. Download all the videos, pass it on to friends and family, let everybody get access to these videos. You can also give them your invitation code, which is in the upper right hand corner of your dashboard in yellow underneath your name. Give them that invitation code and tell them to go to advancedmedicine.com or just simply follow the links in the description of this video. Enjoy part two. There was a, a doctor, I think his name is Kaufman in the West Coast that did a, put out a video that was a really well done video where he shows the similarities between exosomes and viruses, specifically the COVID-19. And there's no distinction. I mean, there's, you know, morphologically, uh, characteristic, size, electron microscopy, everything. So would you like to take that one, Bruce? Would you like to slam that one through the hoop? <laughs> well, uh, let's first go back to the understanding of what the heck is an exosome. Okay. It means a body extruded from a cell. Now, uh, I've been, uh, I was in the cell culture business 50 years ago, cloning stem cells, and, uh, and I did a lot of electron microscopy, and we would see these exosomes on the outside of the cells, uh, and what we recognized them to be at that time were um, degradation products that a cell has some broken pieces or proteins that are not working. They put in a membrane, release it from the cell, and then macrophages will pick up this debris, break it down in the building block. So the original understanding of exosomes were they essentially were uh, devices to help clear out debris from cells. But then they started to look at them and said, wait, they're, they're not all the same. <laughs> they're different ones. And what they started to find out is many of these exosomes uh, of the smaller version, because there's a whole range spectrum, but the smaller ones uh, turned out to have information in them and a target site that they have single-stranded or double-stranded DNA and RNA and cytokines. These are uh, things that regulate uh, our biology, the cells function and the immune system. And, uh, and then they were trying to say, well, they're exosomes. And I go, well, let's be honest, put the definition in these are viruses by absolute definition. There's no way around it, except if you put exosomes, everybody's not thinking viruses. That's right. So psychologically. You They're not thinking something that's going to leap eight feet and get them. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are internal creations. Uh, and just a very important fact, uh, when they did the Human Genome Project, of course, expecting over 100,000 genes, then finding only 20,000 genes, yep. which pulled the entire monkey wrench out of Darwinian biology. That's completely false. Uh, but when they started to uh, uh, look, at, look at these uh, understandings of what's going on in here, uh, what we're starting to recognize is there were only 3% of the genes in the human genome make human proteins for building a body. So 3% of the genome to make us. Then they started to find five to 8% of the genome are viral genes. Right. We have twice as many viral genes as we have human cell genes. And I go, so why was this relevant? Because we have ignored one of the most important aspects of biological life that started with bacteria. I say, what is that? I say, how do cells communicate? Number one, they can release chemicals, which are like hormones. So I have uh, cells releasing chemicals in my body, coordinating my community. That's number one. Uh, number two, you could say the nervous system is controlling things. And I go, yeah, but there's only a small percentage of the cells that are even connected to the nervous system. So out of 50 trillion cells, that's almost irrelevant. And then I go, and the problem with the communication so far is this. This is generalized communication. What if I need, and this is the point, what if I need to communicate, I don't need these cells anymore. If I change my diet, for example, uh, I don't need certain digestive enzyme cells that are not <laughs> being functional. Or what if I need to send a signal that I need more of a certain cell type? In other words, the two important signals are die or proliferate. Exactly. I go, 
you cannot trust this to a hormone or a soluble thing that goes out in the cell because it's not specific enough. Nerves can't do it either. So I say, go back to the bacterial world. They created viruses as a device to you know, send information from one individual to another individual. The design of the virus was to be picked up by the destination that I intended. If you screw up, the virus can be picked up by something else, and now it's like in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, okay? So viruses, let's go back, are the most fundamental means of communication among cells because of the specificity. A virus is like a, a zip-coded telegram. It only goes to the target cell that it's coded for. Uh, let me give a positive sense of why a virus is positive, because not everything, uh, a famous biologist I hung out with, Rasmussen at Yale, uh, uh, and he brought my attention to something way back 100 years ago, that nature doesn't create things that are all bad. There are good sides to things, and then there are bad sides to things. And so what is a good side? And, and, and this is really where it's where going to come into a play here, is, um, for example, uh, when an egg is fertilized by a sperm, the genetics of that, that uh, fertilized egg are not the same as the mother's genetics anymore. Sorry. I say, so what? I say, well, how does the damn thing grow? And I say, the uh, fertilized egg creates extracellular membranes, which create the placenta. And I say, what about them? I say, these membrane cells have to migrate into the mother's uterus so they can connect to the maternal vascular system to nourish the fetus. I go, but what does that mean? I said, it's the equivalent of a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. It's not the same genetics as the mother's cell. I said, but then by all means, then the mother's immune system should reject those fetal cells, wrong genetics. And yet, of course, obviously, these things grow. And uh, thank God, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And I said, yeah, but how is the maternal immune system influenced by the development of this fetus? And I say... The placental cells secrete exosomes, mm. viruses, that are zip-coded to the maternal immune system that when they connect like a memory stick in a computer, they put a program into those immune cells, redirect them away from the embryonic cells. It says, go away. Don't go here. So thank God these exosomes are there because otherwise the placenta would have been rejected as not cell. And then I go... And what if you use that in the wrong way? And I go, ah, <laughs> cancer cells also make these exosomes. I go, what do they do? The exact same thing that placenta cells do. They tell the immune system around the cancer, go somewhere else, do something else, don't bother this. And this is why there's always been a problem. How come cancer cells grow in people when their immune system should reject it? And the answer is, because the cancer cells release exosomes, let's call them viruses, which they are, to redirect the function of the maternal immune system. So I said a positive side of exosomes, we're allowed to have pregnancy. A negative side of the exact same exosome is that it hides a cancer cell from being you know, picked up by the, the immune system. So Bruce, so, if, if I can just interject yes. here as, before you go on, because this is such a critical part, and I want to bring, you know, when you're talking to people, uh, it's the audience, you have to be re uh, cognizant of the audience. And the, and the stupidest audience is always the medical profession. So I just want to bring this home. And, I, you know, since I'm the only clinician here, I can say that because, it, and it's true, because doctors, you know, they're not that, I don't find doctors that bright. People give me all these accolades. And I'm like, it's not that I'm so good. It's just that I'm in a profession that's ridden with such incompetence. I just look good. So I just want to bring this clinical portion back because I know there's going to be doctors that are going to say, well, that's, that's just theory of what Bruce is saying and that doesn't mean anything. But let me tell you something. When you have pregnancy, you do pregnancy tests. You look for home, human chorionic gonadotropin, and you look for alpha fetal protein. Well, what are the other nonspecific markers of cancer that clinicians use when somebody is suspected to have cancer? Oh, alpha fetal protein and human chorionic gonadotropin. We're looking at the same exact clinical markers when we are looking for nonspecific non-specific evidence of the oncogenic process. So Bruce, what you just said, you just gave the didactic explanation of something that clinic is observable, but there seems to be a huge interlude between a doctor or, or the medical profession taking some of this didactic stuff and then being able to extrapolate it into clinical application. So thank you for doing that.
Well, um, I appreciate that. And so I'm going to have to add this because you already brought it up. So I didn't bring it up. Okay. But I, I was a professor in a medical school for years. <laughs> and I can tell you, there are some very bright medical students, but the average medical student is not that bright. And I, everyone sure. says, oh, they're the smartest and brightest students. I say, no, they were selected on their ability to memorize. Yes. Not to think. Yes. But to memorize. And it was one of the aspects. They're also like mules that they can really work hard. They have an endurance factor, you know, being able to work 24, 36 hours. Now, nobody's saying the doctors don't work hard, but that doesn't mean raw cognitive ability. That does not define intelligence. So continue, Bruce. So uh, basically, we have uh, students that are medical doctors that learn by what? Downloading. Whatever I said 20 years ago to a medical student in medical school, I could give them a quiz today and they'll still get the answer right. Why? It's not a thinking, it's a memory disk of all the things. So if they didn't get an insight into what we're talking about in their basic education, then what we're talking about doesn't conform to their, their knowledge base. And they have been programmed, there's this knowledge base and everything else is not relevant. Uh, and this is an unfortunate situation because I was involved with that process. What I taught them, they took down, turned it into concrete, and made a belief system, which then they carry the rest of their practice through. Yeah. So it's interesting because doctors are one of the harder groups to re-educate because if they already have an education, to challenge that without being in the classroom, it's like... It's, it's, not, it's religion. It's, it's religion at that point. So, yeah, yeah well, basically it is. Uh, yeah. and, uh, yes, Judy. And, and can I add one thing to the discussion about exosomes, which I learned? Please, uh, please. I learned it last year from Teresa Deicher. So importantly, when when the mom expels the the, uh, the fetus in delivery, it's when the um, free extracellular nucleic acid, the danger signals. You don't have nucleic acid free in the blood. When that reaches a certain level, that starts the, that's too much damage. I can't stay immune suppressed anymore. And I'm going to expel the fetus. That's the signal. It's big enough because you're starting to release a lot of free RNA and DNA and nucleic acid. And importantly, what she showed, um, and I'll send you that, she wrote up just a, a quick letter, is that that's how much is injected in some of the vaccines of just, just plain free nuclear DNA and RNA will cause literally an abortion, a, a flu shot at a, at a certain time because you, you need those exosomes as you just brilliantly discussed um, to, to, to keep that, to evade the immune response. That's what we're talking about. It's interesting just to add to that because then when this became uh, uh, understood, then the suggestion was, oh, then birth is immunological rejection. Mm, that's exactly right. Makes total sense. The system says, push this out. <laughs> that's birth. So that was actually one of, one of the belief systems that was added to that, Judy, was, in fact, uh, an immune rejection is the uh, movement toward the actual birth process itself. And Bruce, you know what? I'd, I'd like I'd like to actually add something to that. It's interesting because our entire philosophy, and we've treated now patients, as you know, from all over the world, 93 countries now that people have come to us for, for treatment of cancer and other types of chronic disease. But it's interesting that you said that, that birth would be an immunological rejection because when I'm treating the individual with, that has cancer, my thought process is exactly that, that we need to distinguish and let, why does a fetus, why does a body say, okay, it's okay for the fetus to grow. And at some point there's a critical change and then it rejects the fetus. And, and that's when birth takes place versus a cancer where it's saying, oh, I'm, I'm a fetus. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm mimicking a fetus. The cancer is mimicking the fetus. And that's the immune system says, okay, there's no reason for me to go after this. How do I turn that back on? And that's exactly our philosophy. That's exactly where our focus has been on. And that's one reason I think that the success has been so great is that we're able to retrain or re-help the body identify the cancer is being formed as opposed to something that is okay to be left alone and allowed to grow. And that's been the, the key factor for us from what you just said. That's exactly how we've been clinically applying it. Well, uh, you know, uh, Judy's worked on this in her whole career and an understanding about all this is simply this is that why is there a cancer? 
and we want to blame it on genetics. And we say, oh, the cancer cell had stupid genes. And, and, then, and then we say, good, all I have to do is remove the stupid cells and I will be healthy again. I go, no, the cause was never a gene in the cancer cell. And I say, why is it relevant? Because you can remove all the damn cancer cells you want, but you didn't affect the cause of the That's cancer. That's exactly right. Which has to do with the, uh, the the harmony within the system. The seven toxicities, actually. It, and so you want to cure for cancer, killing the cancer cells is, that's the symptom. <laughs> that's not the problem. That's exactly right. The problem is what initiated the cancer, and that was an imbalance at any end of the six or seven things you listed in the beginning. And if we understood that, then the whole damn cancer treatment thing would go completely the other way around because it's not effective because if you keep focusing on the symptom, you never can get to the cause of what the cancer is all about. So let me just... Bruce, if I can just take this and translate this and make sure that every single person understands this. Okay, so for the person that may have heard this, you may want to rewind this portion and hear it again. But let me just explain to you this way. If you went to a mechanic and you said, hey, there's a, there's a sound here I'm hearing in my engine. Can you fix it? And the mechanic says, um, okay, here. And he turns up the music a little bit on the car radio. And he says, can you hear it now? And you say, well, yeah, I can still kind of hear it. And he says, okay, here, here, take some earmuffs and put them on. Can you hear that sound now? And you said, no, I don't hear it. The me mechanic said, yep, you're good to go then. Would you, would you say that that mechanic, you're going to bring your car back to the mechanic? I mean, just everybody understands the car part. So if, a, if you have a knocking sound in your engine, or let's say you have a flashing light in your dashboard, and you're saying, look, there's something going on in my car engine, and the mechanic comes in and takes out the fuse and says, okay, you're good to go now. What would you say about that mechanic? Well, you'd say the mechanic is an idiot, and you'd never go back there. Well, that, that's true. But here's the problem. Why do we accept that in medicine and yet reject that? with our car. We take better care of our car. We do maintenance on a car. We take, do the oil changes. We do the rotation of the tires, but people don't do any maintenance for their own bodies. And yet this whole concept can be simplified. Just think of your car, take care of your body the way you would a car. And so the bottom line, what, what Bruce just said so eloquently again, is that you make sure that you take care of the causation, the etiological factor, the actual issue that caused the problem in the first place by addressing a symptom is never going to do anything else. Einstein who made a, a brilliant, he's made brilliant statements all the time, but one of his favorite quotes that I like is that you cannot fix a problem with the same mindset that created it. And this is one of the issues that we have right now. The, the mindset that we have of fixing cancer is we're going to give chemo, we're going to give radiation, but that's the mindset that created the problem in the first place. We have to recognize and remember, and I'm sorry, Bruce, you opened up the can of cancer, so I had to talk, you know, get my two cents in there. But when you're dealing with something like cancer, you have to address you have to address the external aspect, not just external of your body, but in inside your body, the external aspect. And this comes back to completely why I've said hundreds of times that I've said in public before I even met you, Bruce, um, but why I was so emotional when I first met you and when you called me up on stage is that you changed my life. When I, I was doing this stuff, I didn't understand why I was getting the results until I understood that it is the environmental trigger. If you want to change, you want it and you want to affect the the, the trigger, the signal, by, by changing the signal, then you're going to cause a gene to express in, in a different way. We have 20,000 genes, gene, uh, genes that have been identified in our genome, yet we have 100,000 protein. And the conventional wisdom is that, I like the you know, conventional wisdom, is that one gene defines one protein. If that's the real answer, then how do we have only 20,000 genes, which, are, which is very close to a fruit fly, by the way, or a worm. I can't remember which one it is, but maybe you can correct me on that, Bruce. But we have 20,000 genes that are defining 100,000 proteins. And that's only 100,000 proteins that we've identified. I, I don't know how many other proteins there are out there. So then obviously that throws the entire genomic sequencing aspect out of the window, but they didn't, they didn't listen to that. They just continued down the same pathway, the same mindset that created the problem. They're still continuing down that pathway. All right, I'll stop preaching and I'll let you go back. With Bruce. Well, uh, I, I'll take you up on a little bit about that because the analogy between a body as a vehicle and a car as a vehicle, let, let's look at something very interesting. We go to the junkyard and I got all these dead cars in there. And I said, why are all these cars in here? And then you can say, because they were defective. I go, oh, only a small percent were defective. The massive number of cars in that junkyard were driver error, not mechanical failure. That's right. And when I would come back to the body, I would say exactly the same thing, that when we're having a health issue in our vehicle, 
Do you want to blame it on genes? And the answer right now is genes cause less than 1% of disease. That's a fact right there. So I say, I got 99% of disease not coming from genes. I go, the driver. And I say, who's that? You, your consciousness, and how you are running this vehicle. And this is why the consciousness comes back in. Am I driving this vehicle to keep it in health? I, some people have a car like mine. It's from 1994. I, I still drive it. It's lovely. It works beautifully. Why? I take care of it. If I stopped taking care of it, I would have had a new car by now. And the reality is I have this body. This is my vehicle. If I want to keep it, then I got to take care of it. And, and then when I get uh, you know information from the conventional world, it says, no, it has nothing to do with you. It's your genes that did this. Victim, victim mentality. I'm a victim. That's a victim. I'm a victim. Yeah. And the idea is we're not victims. We're creators. And that's the most important thing we have to know. And epigenetics is finally the mechanism of how... This creates this, and that's why it's a revolution. It takes us from genetics, the belief in genetic control, control by genes, which is victimization. I didn't pick the genes. I can't change them, and they apparently are turning on and off controlling me. I'm a victim versus the new science, epigenetics, and epi means above. So epigenetic control is control above the genes. And all of a sudden, says, oh, my God, if I'm controlling the genes, then I am master of my genes, but with no education, no driver training, I could destroy this vehicle because nobody taught me how to drive the damn thing. Yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> and this is where your work, and Judy's work is so critical because it says, you've been focusing on the wrong damn thing. And we bought it because it's a mechanism that they can sell. That's right. And, and it makes it simple. No, it has nothing to do with you. You got a bad gene. And I go, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, I love this. The story is this. What was the fate of children adopted into families where there's a lineage of cancer running in the family? The adopted child will get the same family cancer with the same probability as natural sibling, except the adopted child has completely different genetics. That's right. That's exactly right. The point was this. The cancer was a, a programming, not a genetic aspect of, of conscious programming uh, and and when we get into this then all of a sudden we have to get back mastery uh, and that's why i so appreciate judy who has donated her life <laughs> to support a truth and, and and then got you know locked up because her truth challenged a business it's called the cancer industry uh, and the whole thing is completely wrong killing people uh, uh, and but people accept it because they're you. You can only you know buy into the knowledge you've been provided, and the knowledge that we are provided with, even in today's media storm about COVID, is not accurate knowledge. And therefore, I, uh, how can I operate the system if the knowledge I've been given is incorrect? And the answer is you can't. And now you're a victim. Exactly. Period. I hope that you enjoyed part two of part six. I know that's confusing of the COVID-19 conspiracy question mark videos and part six being empowering yourself is probably the most important video that we've put out with this COVID-19 conspiracy video series. Tomorrow we'll release part three of part six. And remember you can access the entire video part six and download it as well as all the other parts on the advanced medicine dashboard. Follow the links on the profile. Or if you've already created your advanced medicine dashboard, simply go in, log in, and you'll have access. Part three tomorrow.